Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ here in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We'll be looking at Exodus chapter 14 in just a few moments tonight, so we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Exodus chapter 14. We will be there in just a few moments. If you have any questions, any comments, any concerns or observations about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, if there's some way that we can help you, we want to invite you to get in touch. Send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. Quite a bit has been happening at our church facility lately. I don't know whether you noticed any of this when you were there a few days ago. We haven't given an update for a little while. We may need to do this on a Sunday at some point. But some of you might have noticed that we got a new roof a few weeks ago. So that's some good news. One of those things that just needs to be done every 20 or 30 years or so. We've needed to do it for a few years now. We finally got around to it. Uh, the roof in need of being replaced actually was put on by the church down in Freeport, Illinois, shortly after we purchased our facility back in I think it was October 1st of 2001 was the closing date on this building that we're in. And you may remember we sent out some notes to some area congregations, some sister churches, churches of Christ around us, and we asked if they'd be willing to help us. And the Freeport congregation responded and said, we're just not in a position to help financially. However, uh, how is your roof looking on that new building that you just bought? And they said, the reason we ask is we have about 10 men down here who love putting on new roofs. And so they said they would be willing to do that. If we would get the shingles, we took them up on that offer. And they came up a few months after we bought our building there on Acewood. And they replaced the roof for us, at least uh, put another layer on. And that did us uh, very well for the last 20 plus years. But it was finally time. And now we're happy to have a new roof before the snow flies around here. And then you also might have noticed the new church sign on Sunday. I don't think we said anything about it publicly on Sunday. Just give people a chance to notice it on their own. But Josh, one of our deacons, designed it. We installed it last week. Uh, one of the posts had rotted over the past, I think it had been about 12 years since we updated the sign. So we had to replace one post and put the sign on the other posts that were there with the new post replacing the old one. So the new uh, sign has a bit of color on it. So it's great. It also has the updated website address on it. And as with the roof, we're very glad, very happy to get that done before winter. Uh, we hope to have some fresh stone, some rocks delivered during the next, uh, during the day on Friday, October 27th. So I think that's about a week and a half from now. And several of you have mentioned that you're interested in coming in after work that Friday afternoon to get it all spread out. So we'll have a couple piles probably dropped off in that uh, paved area between the sidewalk and the street right in front of the front door. And uh, time will be of the essence once they dump that rock. We need to get that out of there in a hurry. So as many of you as can help Friday, October 27, let me know. And if you have a wheelbarrow you can bring that we can borrow for an hour or two, uh, let me know that as well. I don't think it'll take us long. We've done this before. And uh, very simple work, just, uh, just getting it moved. And if you can help, let me know. We replaced all of the landscape timbers around the building, the wooden landscape timbers, with uh, landscape bricks and over the summer and a little project I've been working on. So now we need to refresh the bricks, uh, bring them up a few inches with the rock, and uh, that should finish off that project before winter as well. Well, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So tonight we're in Exodus chapter 14, as I mentioned earlier. We have had the 10th and the final plague back in chapter 12. That was the death of the firstborn. Uh, Pharaoh has then forced the people to leave. They celebrated the first Passover on their way out of the land of Egypt. And we ended our study of Exodus 13 last week by noting that God is leading them out into the wilderness in a pillar of cloud by day and by using a pillar of fire by night. And that's the way we left it last Wednesday evening at the end of chapter 13. So that brings us tonight to Exodus chapter 14. So let's jump right back into it tonight. We'll pick up with Exodus chapter 14. And the first paragraph is Exodus chapter 14 verses 1 through 4. Exodus 14 verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before pi Hiaroth between Migdal and the sea. You shall camp in front of baal Zephon opposite it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, They are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. 
Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And they did so. It would certainly be nice to have a map to share, and I thought about that. I looked several up, and uh, there are some great maps out there, but we've had a hard time finding permission to share certain graphics on our YouTube channel. So just to simplify it, if you want to look that up on your own, feel free, either online or in your own copy of the Bible. Just type those names in, Pi, Hieroth, and Migdal, and, and I'm sure almost immediately the graphic that should pop up would be a map of that area. But we're talking tonight about some locations on the Sinai Peninsula, pretty much right between Egypt and Israel. And of course, that whole area has been on the news for the past week and a half or so. But the Sinai Peninsula is this triangle-shaped peninsula pointed down toward the south, toward the Red Sea, with the Gulf of Suez, the Suez Canal on the west side or on the left side, and then the Gulf of Aqba on the east. So it's kind of that uh, peninsula in between those two bodies of water. And as I understand it, plugging these names of these places into an online map, the people basically travel down the western or the left-hand side of the Sinai Peninsula. And they head down and they camp at the southern tip of it. But notice here, God has them, once they get there, do a little zig and then a zag. That's in verse 2. So a little back and forth right there at the end, and the purpose of that little hiccup in their journey is to make Pharaoh think that they are lost. And so God knows that Pharaoh has scouts looking at what they're doing, and this is the plan. Do this little zigzag and uh, make him think that, uh, that you're desperately lost out there in the wilderness. And of course, it's a brilliant move on God's part because God is indeed brilliant. Uh, the Lord's goal here is to pretty much lure Pharaoh into a trap. God can see what's coming. Pharaoh cannot. And God knows Pharaoh even better than he knows himself. Pharaoh has complete freedom of choice here, as I understand it. God is not forcing him to do anything. But God is using Pharaoh's stubbornness. He's using his hardness of heart to teach both Pharaoh and the Egyptians and the Israelites and really the surrounding nations as well this extremely valuable lesson. And it's Pharaoh's stubbornness that gets him in trouble here because he thinks that he knows better than Moses. And his goal is to destroy the Israelites. His goal is to box them in up against the Red Sea with nowhere left to go. Well, God, though, plans on using Pharaoh's arrogance against him and using Pharaoh's army to make a statement. They will know that I am the Lord. So that's the end game here, teaching people a lesson about who God is. And, uh, and they did so. They did exactly what God expected them to do. In other words, Moses starts executing this plan, and uh, he makes the, God makes the command. Moses uh, obeys, and they start working the plan. So let's continue then with Exodus 14, verses 5 through 9. The next paragraph here, Exodus chapter 14, verses 5 through 9. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people, and they said, What is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot ready and took his people with him, and he took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. Then the Egyptians chased after them with all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and they overtook them camping by the sea beside Pi Hiroth in front of Baal Zephon. Well, now we have what is basically a meanwhile back in Egypt kind of moment. The people have left, and as they are now some distance away, Pharaoh has this change of heart. And I find it interesting that we've learned something about Pharaoh's heart in this process, haven't we? Sometimes he hardens his own heart. Sometimes his heart is hardened. Sometimes God hardens his heart. And now we've had several circumstances where his heart has changed, where he's changed his mind back and forth a few times. And so he demands that the people leave. He actually drives them out after the death of the firstborn. And now he's having some serious regrets about that, not very long afterwards. So he's probably thinking about the economic impact of losing two to three million slaves. Uh, this is huge. What have I done? I've made this terrible mistake. We need to go get them. They've got to come back. I, I, I made a mistake in making the people of Israel leave. 
So Pharaoh heads out on this mission himself. This is not something he delegates. But as ruler of the nation, he is the king. He is in charge. He gets the chariot ready. He heads out with this huge army with him. And in this process, we find that God hardens Pharaoh's heart yet again. So Pharaoh makes the decision. But God somehow firms it up a little bit. And I think this goes back to God telling Moses to do the little zigzag in the wilderness, causing Pharaoh to think that they're lost. I think that has something to do with it. So Pharaoh then, seeing this, hardens his resolve. We are going down there, and we're going to get these people, and we're going to take care of it, and we're going to bring them back. And that's exactly what he plans on doing. So he leaves on this mission. Obviously, an army with chariots will travel much faster than a group of two to three million people, with many of them being children, perhaps the elderly. And so Pharaoh and his army, they catch up to them as they are camping there by the Red Sea. So let's continue then with Exodus 14, verses 10, 11, and 12. Exodus 14, verses 10 through 12. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Well, at this point, the account shifts to the perspective of the Israelites. So as they are camping by the Red Sea, the Israelites look up. And the Egyptians are bearing down on them, aren't they? They are marching after them, and the Israelites are absolutely terrified. And I think we need to remember here that the Israelites are basically nothing but runaway slaves at this point. Remember, they have the gold, they've got the precious metals that were given to them by their Egyptian neighbors. But as far as we know, they have no weapons, they have no way to defend themselves, they're a large group. This is not an army. This is men, women, children, elderly, everybody thrown in here together. And these people are practically defenseless. And they are standing there with no weaponry to speak of against one of the most powerful armies in the world at this point. So there is no chance of their survival as they see it. And so they cry out to God. But I also want us to notice that they complain to Moses as well, don't they? And what an accusation here. And this is the first of many, many complaints over the next 40 years. They're being pretty dramatic, aren't they? It is, because, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us way out here to die in the wilderness? In other words, Moses, we understand now that your whole motivation all along has been to take us out here to kill us by uh, taking us out here in the middle of nowhere so that we can be slaughtered by the Egyptians. This is what they're, this is their actual accusation against Moses. And I think obviously if, I mean, we understand this, if God had wanted to kill these people, he could have done it back in Egypt. Could have saved a, a lot of time, a lot of effort. So it doesn't make sense, does it? Uh, why would Moses want to kill his own people? That's something else that doesn't make sense. So there's the method, there's the reasoning behind it. Uh, but let's also realize, as we look at how confusing this is, when we're terrified, our thinking doesn't always make sense, does it? When we're scared, we're not necessarily thinking through things rationally. Sometimes we say and do things when we're scared that we would never do under normal circumstances. So that seems to be what's going on here. And then on top of the accusation, uh, they go in to uh, throw in, and, and I told you so. Um, is this not what we told you back in Egypt? You know, leave us alone because we really want to be slaves. Well, of course, that's not really what they said, is it? Back in Egypt, they had been crying out to God for help and for relief for, for years leading up to this. They wanted to be released from the slavery. And, but again, they're very limited in their reasoning here, in their minds, in their fear. Uh, they only see two options, don't they? Slavery or death in the wilderness. That's all they see here. Slavery or death in the middle of nowhere. Well, of course, we know, looking back on it with 2020 hindsight, uh, there is a third option, isn't there? But they can't see that third option. All they see is slavery 
or death in the wilderness. They're forgetting that there is another possibility. So let's continue on then tonight with Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14. Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. In verse 13, we have an amazingly bold statement from Moses, don't we? Notice he starts by saying, do not fear. It's a good statement right there, a good thing to keep in mind. Just a side note on this, God has already said this several times in the Bible up to this point. You may remember he said it to Abram back in Genesis 15, verse 1. He said it to Hagar through his angel in Exodus 21, 17. He said it to Isaac in Genesis 26, verse 24. So do not fear has already been said at least three times up to this point in Scripture. However, I would also just mention briefly that people will sometimes share a meme on social media. And I've seen variations on it. The one I've seen most often says something like this. In the Bible, God says, do not fear 365 times, one for every day of the year. Okay, that's, that's out there. I've seen that a number of times. I've, I've, people that I know have shared this. Um, 365 times, the Bible says, do not fear. And there's a reason for that. Of course, you know, don't fear. It's one for each day of the year. Well, uh, the problem is, um, God does say do not fear several times in the Bible, but nowhere near 365 times. And so, um, you know, you can do a search online, you can search your uh, Bible on your computer, on your phone, put in parentheses, fear not, or do not fear. And uh, if I remember correctly, it's maybe 80 or 90, a few more you can sneak in if you put a few different wordings in there as al alternates. Um, but we've got decent, godly people going online and sharing what is essentially an outright lie in God's name in sharing that meme, saying that God has said, do not fear 365 times. So, I mean, it's a great message. Don't fear. God has said it a number of times. Um, but it's not true. It, he never said it 365 times. So let's be careful uh, with what we share online. Uh, as with profanity and other negative things, let's also be careful that we don't share something good that may not actually be true. So if I share something like that that you think, oh, wait a minute, is that really true? Check it out. And if it's not, let me know. And I promise to uh, do the best that I can to do the same for you. We want to be honest with the scriptures. So, um, this is a pretty bold thing for Moses to say in and of itself, don't fear. You know, we're just a bunch of people out here with no weapons, and we're staring down the most powerful army in the world. So, don't be scared. Nothing to fear here. I mean, that's one thing. People are trapped. Moses tells them not to be scared. But the other part of this is that Moses promises God's deliverance here. You know, God will take care of this. So, stand by and watch. And the concern in my mind is, I don't think we actually have a record of God communicating this to Moses quite yet. And so at least if we're looking at this as if it's in chronological order, which it's not in this passage, but if that's our assumption going into it, we might think that Moses is making quite the leap with this in speaking where God has not spoken. But we also need to realize that we may not have all of the information here. Uh, just because we don't know about it doesn't mean that God hasn't told Moses what he plans on doing at this point. But nevertheless, Moses makes the promise, you will never need to worry about the Egyptians again, forever. And then secondly, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. And I think that's an interesting little, I don't know, maybe it's not intended as a jab. Um, I would almost see um, God will take care of this. If you would knock it off and stop saying stuff like that, you know, while you keep silent, uh, we learned in our family not to tell people to shut up. That's rude. Uh, but in a sense, that almost seems to be what Moses is saying here. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. There seems to be a condition. If you keep whining, this may not happen the way we plan on it happening. Anyway, all the people need to do is stand there and watch what is about to happen. This is something that they will really, there will not be much effort on their part. So let's continue tonight with Exodus 14, verses 15 through 18. Exodus 14, verses 15 through 18. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. As for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. Once again, I feel like we're missing something here. Moses tells the people that God will fight for them while they're silent. And the next thing we know, God is saying to Moses, why are you crying to me? Um, but the message is, go forward, move. And I find it interesting that uh, Wisconsin's motto is forward, isn't it? So this forward motion, move, go forward. You know, stop whining, stop talking, but do it, move forward. As to the how, God tells Moses that he needs to lift his staff and stretch out his hand over the sea to divide it. And the people are to go through in the middle of the sea on dry land. So it's a very simple command. There's no huge effort involved. It's just walking, just like they always do. But they are to do this walking in obedience to God's command. And when God makes a command, he makes that command possible. So Moses is to lift his staff over the sea, and the people are to cross through the sea on dry land. Well, God's role in this, besides splitting the sea is to harden the hearts of the Egyptians in a way that they will try to cross the sea as well. So they're going to chase the Israelites, and God will be honored in that process as we're about to see. So let's continue with Exodus 14, verses 19 and 20. Exodus 14, verses 19 and 20. The angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was the cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus the one did not come near the other all night. Well, basically we have just a brief update concerning the pillar of cloud and some new information concerning the angel of God. Uh, the cloud, instead of leading from the front, as they had been accustomed to up to this point in the short journey, it now moves behind the people to protect them from the Egyptian army. And it looks like the angel of, of God does as well. And as I was thinking about this, if we could just imagine this from the people's perspective, they've been following this pillar of cloud. That's clearly the plan here. We're, we're following that. And now this pillar of cloud rotates and moves behind them to face the Egyptians. If I'm in the crowd, my question is, do we follow it now? Because if so, the cloud appears to be leading us directly at the Egyptian army. Remember, this is a huge group, and communication may not happen as quickly as it does today. So you're following a cloud, and suddenly the cloud moves and goes between you and the Egyptians. I think the first assumption for most people would be, oh no, we need to follow this cloud, and we're going to clash with the Egyptian army. Of course, that's not what happens. I'm just saying from the perspective of the people, uh, that would have been a logical thing to assume here. However, let's continue with Exodus 14, verses 21 through 25. Exodus 14, 21 through 25. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, so the waters were divided. The sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Then the Egyptians took up the pursuit, and all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen, went in after them into the midst of the sea. At the morning watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve, and he made them drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians said, Let us flee from Israel, for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. Well, we finally come to the crossing of the Red Sea. Moses obeys by stretching out his hand over the sea. The Lord takes care of this by causing the strong east wind to divide the waters all night long. The people cross over on dry land. We find this passage uh, this is where the water uh, is like a wall on each side. This is also, I. It, it's looking more obvious to me. It seems this is an all-night event, and in my brain, I, I see this happening in the daylight. 
Oh, but this certainly appears to be an all-night event. I mean, to get two to three million people across any body of water, that's going to take some time. That's like the whole population of the city of Chicago crossing over. And as God had planned, the Egyptians try to chase them through the sea. Well, look what they're doing. Certainly we can do it too. Let's go get them. However, in the morning, God causes some confusion among the Egyptians, causing their chariot wheels to swerve, making it difficult to drive. And the Egyptians suddenly realize God is fighting against them, so they try to turn around. If you remember, uh, they've already had some pretty recent uh, negative experience, haven't they, with the ten plagues. And they recognize, I believe, that the God of the plagues is continuing to be involved here. He is not some regional God limited to Egypt like some of theirs are. Uh, but this God is with his people even away from where they live. So let's continue then tonight with Exodus 14, 26 through 29. Exodus 14, 26 through 29. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come back over the Egyptians, over their chariots and their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak, while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And again, I had forgotten until this, uh, reading this again this week while preparing for tonight's class, but Moses plays a role in the water closing back over the Egyptians. In my mind, I just thought God did this. And obviously God is the one who does this, but God has Moses be a part of it. Moses is the trigger for it. Moses is the leader. And my thought here is that God is still working to establish Moses as a leader in the eyes of the people. He's still giving Moses some credibility, kind of an extra dose of respect among the Israelite people. Because remember, he's kind of unfamiliar to them. He's been away for 40 years. He's kind of a newcomer. So not only did Moses help prepare their way across the sea, but Moses is now also playing a key role in defeating the entire Egyptian army. So the sea comes back together. Every Egyptian in the sea at that time is drowned in the Red Sea. As we think about this, I'm thinking about some of those who suggest that the splitting of the Red Sea was a natural occurrence. Have you heard that? I've heard that even among God's people, you know, people suggesting, well, you know, this, this east wind would come in at a certain time every year, and, and there were spots where the sea was so shallow, there were certain places there where this wind, it would probably make it appear that the sea was divided when it really wasn't anything miraculous. You see what's going on there? People trying to explain away a miracle that God performed by attributing it to something purely natural? And I've heard that a number of times from, from decent people saying, oh, you know, in history we read about, no. You know, as some have pointed out, if this was a natural occurrence in a shallow part of the sea, then the real miracle would be the entire Egyptian army drowning in shallow water. You see, by trying to explain this away, it really only creates a new difficulty, doesn't it? People say, well, it was the kind of reeds in there about six inches deep and no that's not what happened at all it's much better i think just to take god at his word here all right let's conclude tonight the last couple verses this is exodus 14 verses 30 and 31 exodus 14 30 and 31 thus the lord saved israel that day from the hand of the egyptians and israel saw the egyptians dead on the seashore when Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. I don't want to be too morbid, but verse 30 is probably in my list of top five verses, <laughs> favorite verses from the book of Exodus. And it's, it's so visual. I can picture this in my mind. The next morning, You've walked through the sea on dry land after a near-death experience, and obviously you're going to look back. What just happened? And when they look back at the Red Sea, they could see the bodies of the dead Egyptian soldiers washing up on the seashore. That right there had an impact. That was a very visual reminder that God was far more powerful than they ever could have imagined. And as a result, the people fear God. But I also want us to note here that they also believe in God's servant Moses. And this is what I was talking about earlier. God is not only saving and leading his people, 
but he's actually establishing Moses as the leader of his people, giving him some weight, giving him some credibility for what's about to come next. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 14. Thank you for being with us tonight. If you have any questions, concerns, comments about tonight's class, if there's some way that we can help, if there's something we can do to encourage you, if there's something we need to be praying about, get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274. We would really love to hear from you. As we close this part of our, our study, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are a God who leads your people. You not only show us the way to go, but you protect us along the path. You show us and you teach us how to live, but Father, we trust that you also make it possible. Thank you, Father, for loving us as you do. We come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.